for the next probably four to four to five weeks, want to go down this path called the afflicted path, actually a new series here that want to really focus in on the path that we sign up for as Christians. You know, that path that, you know, the scripture tells us that we are to walk. And we want to look at that. What, you know, what is that? supposed to look like? What does Christ actually call us to? And that's what we're going to talk about tonight a little bit is Christ's invitation to each and every one of us individually, to us as a church collectively. What is that invitation that he gives to us that we are asked to respond to? So if you want to get into your Bibles, Bible apps, we'll be doing a little bit of flipping around. But where I wanted to start tonight with was in Matthew chapter 16. All right, And we've read this verse a lot of times before, but Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. This is kind of the basis for, uh, I mean, certainly for tonight, but I think for this whole you know, series, however long it does end up lasting. And the verse says that, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And, you know, we read that quite a bit. Right? We read that all the time, and um, I think sometimes we can just kind of gloss over it probably a little bit because it just becomes so commonplace. But I want to talk about, or just think about, what does it really mean to follow after Jesus? You know, what does it really mean to be a disciple of Christ? And I think what's, what's happened in the church over time is we've kind of developed... I think, an, a somewhat unbiblical view of Christ's invitation to the church, the Christ's invitation to, to all of mankind. I think we've kind of developed a view that maybe isn't quite scriptural. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Because I think that it is perhaps most you know, exemplified in a question that each and every one of us at some point in our lives has either been asked or we have asked. You know, probably many times. And that question is, when were you saved? Right? That's a common question that we ask people, that people ask us. And I mean, well-intentioned. Uh, but I think it kind of does speak a little bit to the way that we look at Christ's invitation to us and we kind of miss the mark a little bit. Because when we ask that question, we, I think we look at that point of saying that we follow Christ, of, you know, when you think of that, probably your first thought is, okay, um, where was I when I prayed the prayer? And I can tell you where I was. I remember the day, I remember the moment, I remember all of that when I, you know, I quote unquote prayed the prayer. Uh, and I think that's how we tend to, to think of that. We think of that as that, you know, that just believe it's that one time event. And, you know, I would go through even, much of my childhood into, as I, you know, as I grew up, even into being a teenager, I constantly want to pray that prayer again, just in case maybe God didn't hear it very well the first time, or I wasn't sincere enough, or did I really mean it? But I think we all know that that one point in time may be that point where you actually made that decision to truly follow Christ, and you did begin following him. But I think that proof comes months, years down the road. You know, was that something that was an emotional response? Was it a, you know, was it something that was a real decision? Was it something we said, okay, I know what I'm actually getting myself into, uh, and I'm going to walk that path? And I think oftentimes uh, it perhaps, perhaps isn't. And we'll talk about that tonight. But I think that even that, that viewpoint even impacts the way that we would witness to others, the way that we would evangelize uh, to, the, to those who are lost. And it's what we would typically call the Roman road. And we actually, I quote this passage all the time, but I'll do it again, Romans 10, 9 to 10. It says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, now we've talked a lot about what that confession really is, um, but typically we don't necessarily view it that way that we've discussed it before. So it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And so 
that's the Romans road way to salvation. It's believe, confess, and that is what, you know, done deal, one time event. And so we basically turn it into, a, I think, a formula, because the church likes formulas for things. We have the sinner's prayer, we have confess Christ, believe in him, throw in some baptism in there as well, uh, and then you're saved. And that's kind of the formula uh, that we talk about week after week in the church. And I think if that's all that we were called to, if it was just, you know, just believe, just say this prayer, uh, you know, get baptized, I think that's a fairly, it's pretty easy really, that's a fairly cheap view of salvation. If that's all that it was, and I think that becomes very appealing because, again, we don't like to get outside our comfort zones too much. Oftentimes, we don't really like to, whether it's a spiritual thing or not, we don't like to suffer. I mean, I know that that's not what I wake up in the morning hoping. I hope I'm going to suffer a lot today. Uh, that's really not high on my priority list from certainly a, a natural standpoint. And so I think that that leads us probably sometimes a little bit to, to seek out uh, you know, teaching and uh, affirmation that whatever assures me of my salvation with minimum inconvenience to my life, the way that I want to live it, uh, the least personal cost that can uh, impact my lifestyle, that'd be great. That's why the prosperity gospel is, is so popular, as it says, come to Christ and get riches and, and have this incredible lifestyle. And that's, of course, very appealing. But what we see in, at least what we'll talk about tonight, what I see in Scripture is maybe a little bit different. Not that God can't bless. We see that in Scripture too. Not that there can't be uh, uh, physical blessing, uh, but that isn't our focus. It should be spiritual blessing. It should be a spiritual focus. And so I think ultimately what we do is we focus in on these few verses that really speak very little of a surrendered life or of suffering, and then we build our whole gospel of salvation around that. But then we get to verses like Philippians 1.29, and it says there that it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. So it's clear there, not just believe, but also suffer. But there's an interesting phrase at the beginning of that verse that kind of stood out to me uh, this past week, and that was that it has been granted to you. It's an interesting way to put that. Because typically, if, if something is being granted to you, uh, it's something that you want, right? If, if it's like you're being granted your request. And so that's interesting to say that it's been granted to you to not just believe, but to also suffer. As if we actually want to suffer. So why would that, I mean, that, again, naturally speaking, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I don't think. Because, uh, again, we naturally want the easy path. But if we go to 1 Peter chapter 4, and like I said, we'd be jumping around a lot. 1 Peter 4, uh, verses 12 and 13. Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So again, first of all, Peter makes clear that Suffering is a normal part of the Christian experience. You know, don't be surprised about that. That's what you're signing up for. When you accept Christ's invitation to follow him, that's part and parcel with it. But he says at the end, they rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So I think that that, at least in part, ties back to Philippians 1, 29, when it says it's been granted to you. You know, as if it's something we want. And I think Peter's saying, well, what we want is to rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Because for that, we need to share in Christ's sufferings as well. So even though it might seem like, okay, do I want to suffer? Not just speaking, no, but do I want the joy that is set before me when I do enjoy those sufferings? I think the answer there uh, becomes a yes. But I think, again, the, the natural tendency of, of just human nature in general is to seek out the easiest path possible, you know, the path of least resistance. You know, that is certainly the case for, I mean, it's not a perfect example, but in traffic, I'll drive around for an extra half hour to not have to sit in traffic. 
I look for the path of, the path of least resistance. As long as I don't have to sit there, I'm fine. So just naturally, we want to avoid anything that is inconvenient for us. And the truth is God has provided a path. We see that all throughout Scripture. And I think what we can identify is it's not necessarily an easy one. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but the path that we're called on starts with a narrow gate. And I believe it's that narrow gate that Paul is describing in Romans 10 that we just wrote, read a moment ago. Because Christ is the entry point into salvation. All right, so Christ, what we're talking about in Romans 10, that is our narrow gate in which we enter in. But after we enter in, there's more to come. But let's stick on this point first. We'll talk about the path, but let's stick on the entry point because I don't want to miss the entry point. That's a really important point. So let's go to John chapter 10 just for a minute. Uh, John chapter 10, verses 7 to 9. It says there that Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So again, right back to Romans 10. If you want to enter in by me, if you will confess and believe, then you will be saved. Right? So that is a complete and finished act. Right? There's no, you may be saved, or you will most likely be saved. You know, nothing that gives any ambiguity that maybe, maybe not, it's he will be saved. And while that is part of Christ's testimony while he was here, it's not the entire testimony of Christ. You know, if that was all that he said, that was the only message, then we could stay there and be content. But he does go on and say more to us. He says that we are to enter by the gate, but then we're to walk the path that leads to life. So we see verses like Matthew 24, 13. It says that, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. I want to stop there for a second. I'm going to give a quick story there where I think, you know, when we look, about, look at starting to walk down a path um, where we need to endure to the end, I think a lot of us don't have, again, a natural sometimes a natural comparison, a natural thing to draw on to really illustrate what that looks like. You know, Shannon might be the closest to us. He likes to go hiking a lot. He has to probably do, learn to endure uh, to the end of a particular hike. And I can, Carrie's not here tonight, obviously, but um, when we were in Italy a few years ago, we were in this region uh, along the coast called Cinque Terre, and there's this really famous hike uh, all up through like the vineyards and along the coastline. It's a beautiful hike. Uh, there's some really steep areas. And in 40 degree heat in the middle of July, uh, it's not the most pleasant uh, path to be walking on. And so one morning we got up early. We were trying to beat the heat. That didn't work because it's just always hot. And we entered in through the gate. That was the easy part. Started to walk through the path for probably 45 minutes. Got to the point, just can't do this anymore. This is too difficult. We turned around and went back and decided to just hang out in the town. Now, that's not a very good example for me of saying enduring to the end, because I did not endure to the end. I gave up and went back. But for me, that's a picture of starting out in this path. It was not an easy path. It was actually very difficult. If it had been a flat path, it had been no problem. But there was lots of climbing. There was jumping over rocks. It was the toughest part of the whole journey. And... It got to the point, could not endure that because it was difficult, turned around, went back. But again, Matthew says in verse 13, the one who endures to the end will be saved. So that's a picture that I get. If you're on this path, you need to, if you need to endure it, it's not always going to be easy. There's going to be points where you want to turn back. Because Hebrews 10, 39, again, this really shines light poorly on me given that story. It says that, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So again, there's this idea of 
we enter by the gate, but we're on this path and we want to endure while we're walking this path. And so, I mean, there's plenty more scriptures we could talk about tonight, but I think the, the point here is that we need to believe in Christ, we need to confess him as Lord, but that then needs to lead to us over time yielding our whole life to him, you know, actually following him uh, wherever he leads, whatever example that he has set for us. You know, we've talked recently about, uh, if we look at, we read through the various Gospels, there are some stories that appear in, in some Gospels, they don't appear in others, you know, some parables only a pop-up in one, one Gospel, etc. And sometimes, you know, some Gospels go into more detail, some don't. We've talked a lot about that. But one thing that every Gospel writer includes is that truth about the testimony of Christ. None of them skip that part. None of them skip the need to endure in your faith. Right, so I think that's an important thing that we need to be able to recognize and hone in on. And we saw that right at the beginning when we talked about Matthew 16, 24 again. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. But we'll look at the other Gospels as well. We'll read one more from Matthew, Matthew 19, 21. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, and this is Jesus to the, uh, the rich young ruler, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Uh, Mark 8.34, we have another example. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. And again, we've talked about this in the past, in the past, when we see the word life there, this is where Greek, and going back to that Greek word is helpful, it's the Greek word suchi, which we get soul. So it's the idea of whoever would save his own soul, his own emotions, his own will, his own desires, his own natural tendencies. You know, that person will lose his life. But whoever actually begins to give up those things, whoever actually begins to trade your natural life for the life that Christ enables you to live, that is the person who will save his life. Luke 9.23 says that he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And we'll even get out of the synoptic gospels. We'll go to John chapter 10, verse 27. It says that my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And last one, John 12, 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And so I think, you know, where I'm ultimately wanting to go with this is that I think many in the church don't actually want to know the real invitation from Christ. You know, we don't actually want to know that Christ expects us to actually suffer, to actually have to do things that we don't naturally want to do. Because it's very easy to say, okay, I believe in you, now I want my get out of hell free card. Again, it goes to that cheap view of salvation. Just, I want this end goal. I just want to get out of there. That's all I'm looking for. And so I think the, what we've done oftentimes is focused on Christ being the gate which he is, and which there is no other way, no other name on heaven and earth that you can call in which we are saved. You know, he is the gate in which we enter in, in which when we confess him, we believe in him, we will be saved. End of story. You know, that is a complete and finished act. But we focus on that, avoiding the fact that once we do that, there still is a, a path to walk. There still is a life we are called to as Christians. Matthew 7 uh, starting in verse 13, this is in, during Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says this. He says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So the gate is narrow. Again, the way to, the way to Christ is, it's not an easy gate to enter through. It's a narrow gate. 
You know, there's not various ways in which you can get onto this path. It's Christ. There's no, no other religious leader, no other prophet, nobody else. Christ is the only entrance onto this path. It is coming to him first, having him forgive you of your sins first, repenting and choosing to follow him. But then the way is hard that leads to life. Some versions say the way is afflicted, which is where we get the name for this particular series. So the gate is now, the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Now I think we would agree, if we look at the, the church and, and you know, encapsulate all the, the different denominations, including Catholicism and everyone that would claim to be Christian, we probably wouldn't say that that is few. That you probably say that that's quite, quite a few. There, there are many. But the Bible says, Jesus says, that there's going to be few who actually find this narrow gate and this, this hard path, this afflicted path that leads to life. So Christ's invitation isn't just to believe on him. It's to believe on him and also to follow him, to follow his example. And it's following him where there's cost involved. Right? The believing on him, that's his finished work on the cross. But in actually saying, yes, I will follow you, there is cost for my life personally in saying that I will follow you. you know, we see that again in all of the Gospels. We'll just, I'll just read a couple examples. Luke chapter 14, verse 26 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And those are pretty strong words. Again, it's not may not be my disciple, it's cannot. That's a very affirmative statement. But I think sometimes though we look at, well, what does he mean by hate my mother, my father? That's, aren't we told to, to love people? So let's, let's go to Mark 10 and, and uh, 1029, and maybe get a better understanding for uh, the tone, the, uh, the way in which this, this message is meant. As Mark says that from Jesus, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. So it's talking about what do you love more? If we go back to the fall, we, we talked about Abraham who followed God into a new land. He left behind his old way of life. We saw that same thing in the story of, of Isaac and Rebekah. And Rebekah left her whole family behind to go on this new life towards Isaac, who he said was representing Christ in that story. And so this is, isn't about hating them, it's about willing to leave everything else behind, everything else that we know, that we care about, that we love, because we want to follow Christ, because we love him more. It's not about hate, it's about who do we love the most, what are we willing to give up to follow him. Luke 9, 57-62 to is the last example I'll give. It says that as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And again, that might seem, some of those examples, that seems kind of harsh. But I think, or I know, that God knows the heart. That was the first excuse. I'm sure there were more coming. 
let me do this first. Okay, I got to go do handle this first. There's always going to be a reason why we can't follow. And so it ultimately, we say it all the time, it comes down to a heart condition, I think. But in each of those encounters, it was after the issue of following Christ arose that the cost came up. Right? The cost arose after following Christ became an issue. Now, up until that point, there wasn't that cost, but actually following Christ involved a cost in each of those instances. And so I think it's important, let's define what it actually is to follow Christ very quickly because we don't have that much time tonight. But you know, for the disciples, in some respects, you could say it was pretty straightforward. It was hear his voice and do what he says. You know, it's obey his commands. And it's, I mean, it's much the same for us today from the perspective of a Christian discipleship always begins, first and foremost, with an invitation. Right? That was the case with the disciples as well. Matthew 4, 6, uh, 4, 18 to 22. We see there that while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. And so there we see no excuses, no, well, let me just cast this net, or let me pull this back up, let me help my father with this, let me, well, let's take the day's catch home first. The word immediately pops up three or four times in that very short passage. Say, as soon as they were called, as soon as he said, follow me, immediately they acted and they went. So that pattern, we won't read every example, but that pattern is repeated over and over again as Christ calls his disciples. This is pattern of laying aside the former life and following Christ. We saw that, we read that from Matthew. Matthew himself had that same experience. You know, he was a tax collector, this outcast in, in, for most of the rest of society. As soon as he was called, he left his post behind, his lucrative post, and followed Christ. So there's always that pattern of laying aside the former life. Laying aside, in their case, their jobs, uh, families, and following Christ. And so I think that same example applies to us, at least in, it's going to be different cases, but to some degree that applies to us as well. I think where it is always the same and not circumstantial is that it's the laying aside our life that pertains to our soul. Our soul, again, being that mind, our will, emotions. You know, that soul that initially, before we come to Christ, identifies only with the spirit of the world that is in us. But after coming to Christ, it's that, again, that our mind, our, our will, beginning to identify more with and respond more to the spirit of God than the spirit that is in the world, the spirit that has ruled us to that point in our lives. You know, that's what it is to take on Christ as our leader, that Christ on our, as our guide, to take on Christ as the one that we are following, is to have our soul interacting more and more with the Spirit of God than the Spirit of the world. And so even though I think, I mean, I know I've had the thought plenty of times that you know, it would be kind of great if, if Christ could have been alive in my lifetime, um, you know, it would be so much easier just to actually have him physically here telling me what to do. I know I'd do it then. Because, I mean, is Jesus telling me to do it? I mean, why would I question him? It would be so much easier if he was just right, always constantly behind me. Hey, Shane, do this, or I want you to do that now. It sounds in so many respects like you know, those 12 disciples and, and the many others that, that, that followed him. Well, they had us so much better. And even though Christ isn't here, obviously, physically, you know, he still does give us guidance. And he even said, we know we can re recall some of his last words to the disciples, it's better that he were to go. 
And I've always found that to be an interesting statement. But I want to read something from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, 1 Corinthians, and if, just turn there for a moment, because I think this is a really important passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. And it's important because I think this gives the answer of why, in no uncertain terms, it is better that Christ has gone and sent the Spirit than he had, had been stayed. So it says there that these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. Now, if you missed that, let me recap. It's saying that who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person? Right? The spirit of the world, the spirit that is within us, knows our thoughts. That's how we know what we're thinking. And it says that the spirit of God searches even the depths of God. That the spirit of God knows the thoughts of God. And it says that we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. In other words, that we might understand the very thoughts, to be able to search the very depths of God. That is why the spirit is within us, and we have access, direct access to God through his spirit. So Christ sent his spirit to reveal the thoughts of God to mankind, to each and every one of us. That is how we can know the will of God for our lives. It's through the Spirit of God in us. Right, so Christ, if we look through his example that he set for us, if we look through the example in his, his three-plus year ministry, you know, after he was baptized, we see that, that scene where the, the, the dove descends from heaven, the Spirit comes upon him. And from that moment forward, his ministry begins because the Spirit is working within him. Now, the disciples didn't have that at that point in time. They didn't have that, of course, until the book of Acts. But they didn't have that until that point. And so for them, it wasn't until that point that they could truly follow Christ, truly allow the Spirit to work within them, to have that direct communion with God. Until that point, they were learning from Christ, but they didn't have that same experience that Christ had. And so if we look at what was Christ's actual example, while he was here on earth, during his ministry, he was led by the Spirit in all things. He always would pray to the Father before doing anything. He was constantly in tune with the Spirit and knowing the will of the Father. And so that's the pattern for our lives if we want to follow him. It's having the Spirit in us, being led by the Spirit, in all things. So if we don't put our soul, our, our own will and emotions to death, if we don't begin to identify more with the Spirit of God and follow more to the, the Spirit of God as opposed to the Spirit of the world, we will never have that experience of following Christ. John chapter 5, 19 to 20 says this. It says that Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. In greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. So how does he see what the Father is doing? is through the Spirit of God that was within him. That's the pattern for us to follow as we begin to commune more and more with the Spirit of God in us. That's what it means, I believe, to follow Christ. You know, that's always been the invitation. It hasn't been, when did you pray the prayer? You know, when did you make that momentary decision? But what did that, not that you can't pray the prayer, but what did that lead to? What has your life looked like since then? You know, so it's not merely enough to believe and confess certain things about him. Because we can all say, if you've been in church long enough, you know how to say the company line. 
You know, you know the right things to say, the, the, th the ways to act. And you can fool everybody else. I'm not saying that's any of us, but I mean, you, you, know, you, that, you know that that is the case. And you've all, I'm sure, seen throughout your life people that you perhaps grew up with in the church that have since long walked away from the faith. That for the longest time, you know, they were playing the game or they were putting on a good show. But had they ever truly began walking that hard path, but never truly hearing from the Spirit of God and putting their soul to death, their own natural response to things as opposed to actually seeking out the Spirit of God. And so this invitation, as we kind of begin to wrap this up tonight, this invitation that we're talking about is to ultimately enter into a Spirit-led life where we do nothing of our own initiative. That was Christ's example. He did nothing, we see that over and over again, that he did nothing of his own initiative. He did nothing that was not the will of the Father. That's what we're called to. You know, that's our invitation as believers. You know, as a disciple, if we were to walk as Jesus walked, and we say this all the time, the student needs to become like the master. You know, the student needs to become like the teacher. Well, the teacher always submitted to the will of God. He did nothing of his own initiative. And that's what we're called to. So if we go right back to, we go back to Matthew chapter 16. You know, we read verse 24 at the beginning. Again, take up your, deny me, take up your cross, follow me. If we go right to that next verse, verse 25. It says, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And we've read that a couple times tonight. You know, that's where he went to right away. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, die to self, but follow the Spirit of God within you. And so I think that, you know, based on Christ's own illustration of a narrow gate and a, and a, a hard way, a hard path, an afflicted path, I think that we could say that many have perhaps entered the gate, uh, but not necessarily found that path that leads to life. Maybe they're like me in Italy and the path is kind of hard and you turn back and go sit on the beach, which I did. Again, I'm a poor example on this. I, this would be much better if we had actually stuck it out. It'd be a much more fulfilling story. But fortunately, uh, I could have lied. Carrie's not here tonight. But in closing this up tonight, Christ never gave any invitation aside from this one. His only invitation was to be his disciple, to follow him. And as we saw tonight, we can't be his disciple if we're not willing to do all those things we've just talked about. If we're not willing to actually leave our old way of life behind. Last verse tonight, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Peter says that, for to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So Peter makes it plain right there. I mean, he had the privilege of knowing Christ personally. He also obviously had the Spirit working within him. And he's saying that the reason you've been called, the reason you've been given an invitation, is that because Christ suffered, he gave you that example that you could follow in his steps. And so the question would be, is that really the invitation that we oftentimes hear, and is that one that we personally have accepted? Because Christ's invitation for us is more than just, again, it's more than just believing. It's more than just saying certain things about him. You know, that is that narrow gate, and it all starts there. There's no other way in, but are we willing to walk that afflicted path? that hard path where it's going to get hot, where it's going to get uncomfortable, where it's going to go against you know, those things that are convenient for us. It's going to go against those things that we would choose for ourselves that in our natural life, you know, we would just turn around and, and head the other way. We'd seek out that wide path, the flat one right along the coast, probably walk along the beach. You know, are we going to do that? Or do we know what the joy is that is set before us? And do we love that more than houses 
and mothers and brothers and lands and all these things behind us. And so that's the challenge for us tonight. That's the, the direction we're going to go for the, the next few weeks in this series is looking at, okay, we've entered the narrow gate. Uh, what next? What does it actually mean to be a disciple? How do we practically do that as a Christian? What are those challenges that we face as Christians? Uh, and how do we overcome those and begin to more deeply interact with the Spirit of God in our lives than the Spirit of the world that is constantly trying to pull us back through that gate?